So, Stephen, as we take a look here at the NFC West, we wanted to kind of start with the team where we're looking around going, I mean, you know, we think we kind of know what this team is all about, but at the same time, it could be drastically different if the quarterback situation doesn't play out like they're leading us to believe, and that is going to be the Los Angeles Rams. And with this Los Angeles Rams squad, we're sitting here going, okay, they're just being extremely cautious with Matthew Stafford. He's got a ton of, he got an incredible amount of experience. There's no reason for them to do anything out of the ordinary with Matthew Stafford. But then you start to hear, you know, the quote coming out that it was a air quote, weird injury for a quarterback. And you start to go, huh, I don't really like to hear someone say that it's a weird injury for a quarterback. And then they're being extra cautious with John Walford as well because they don't want to get him injured in all this. And so he doesn't play in the preseason game. And then you start going, huh, why are they why are they protecting John Walford so much? Like, that seems a little <laughs> odd as well. So it does make me start to at least have to consider what we may or may not want to do in this division from a betting standpoint. I mean, listen, I'm – even with John Walford is never going to be the Seahawks. The best number you can get on them is 22 to one. If you're looking to bet the Seahawks for the division, don't do it. I don't know why you would do it, but anyway, 22 to one on the Seahawks, but the Cardinals are sitting out there. You can find a four to one on the Cardinals. You can find a plus plus one eighty on the 49ers. The best number you can find on the Rams is a plus plus one twenty five. I mean, I know you're not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I've actually done zero minutes of medical school actually. So I have not, I don't know anything about any of this stuff, but what I can say is what we hear isn't at least incredibly encouraging. For sure, but I will say, Matt, that the the latest news we have, we're recording this on August the 17th, and Matthew Stafford returned to practice and was throwing the ball on August 16th. So if there was even a little bit of concern that this could be something that gets worse or cost him regular season games potentially – I don't think they're having him out there practicing on August the 16th, three, four weeks before the regular season starts. So I am more optimistic that Matthew Stafford is going to be okay for the season than I initially was. I was just as concerned as you were when all the news initially came out, but he practiced. He was throwing on August the 16th on Tuesday. And the quote from Sean McVay to reporters was, I thought he had great energy, great command all day. I thought he threw the ball incredibly accurately in all parts of the field, really activated all parts of our pass game. There were a couple where he's hitting the spots we want, and we just have to be able to finish some of those plays. I'm encouraged because we can coach off of those and we're getting, you know, so some more talk, coach speak there. But the, the greater point to me is that, if this was any concern whatsoever, if this was like what we saw with Dak Prescott last year, they didn't practice him at all. They didn't play him in the preseason at all with that weird shoulder thing. They were bringing in guys from the Texas Rangers to help with it. The fact that Stafford already was back practicing on August the 16th is encouraging to me. Yeah. Liam Cohen comes over to serve as offensive coordinator this season. He is coming off of being the offensive coordinator at Kentucky, but the year before that, he was the quarterback's coach with the Rams. So he is very familiar with Sean McVay, very familiar with this offense, very familiar with how McVay wants to do things from a system standpoint. So again, he was gone last year to Kentucky as offensive coordinator, but he's back after being the Rams quarterback coach in 2020. Raheem Morris back as defensive coordinator as well. On the inside of things, not a lot. I mean, listen, the only real three impact players they signed, Allen Robinson, Bobby Wagner, and Troy Hill, they got via trade. So, I mean, listen, this is... Those are three very big impact players. Don't get me wrong. You add a Bobby Wagner on the defensive side. You add an Allen Robinson on the wide, at the wide receiver position. You add Troy Hill into the secondary. Those are three big impact players. That said, you do lose some impact players along the way as well. Von Miller's gone. You lost Sebastian Joseph Day off that defensive line. You lost Austin Corbett off the offensive line. Darius Williams is playing corner elsewhere. Sonny Michelle, not that running backs matter all that much, but he's gone. You got Johnny Hecker, the best best passing cor- uh, kicker in all of the NFL, <laughs> uh, who's gonna who's who's out as well. He is no longer there, and unlike a lot of teams, because the Rams went all in and hey, it worked, it paid off. They won the Super Bowl, but unlike a lot of teams where we see a lot of these big name guys go, Stephen, we go to the draft and we say, okay, well, you know, here's where they went to replenish. Well, 
the Rams didn't have a first round pick. The Rams didn't have a second round pick, right? So they didn't have a first. They didn't have a pick until they get to the third round, where they took offensive guard Logan Bruss, who, by the way, might have to end up starting for this team as a rookie, with the way that the offensive line has started to shake out for them because Andrew Whitworth retired as well, um, which is a big loss for a team, which is again not, not a guy going elsewhere or or getting traded, but still, when you retire, that is a loss as well. So, um, lots of guys out. Not a ton of guys in, but I do like the guys that they do brought in. Listen, I think you are of the same line, mindset as me. We're going to find out if Allen Robinson is actually any good or not because this is the first time in his career he's actually played with a good quarterback. And so, you know, I have fairly high hopes for what Allen Robinson still is as a player. He's not incredibly old yet, and he is stepping into about the best situation ever because he doesn't have to be the absolute number one, because we know that that's Cooper Cup. His props were only the second player I found that I want to bet the overs on going into the season. Football's a violent sport. I didn't do as well with overs last year as I did on unders going in, so shifting my strategy there. We're talking about a a player in Allen Robinson who has seasons of 1,100, 1,200, and more than 1,400 yards in his career despite horrific quarterback play. And his over-under for yards is set at 850. His touchdown prop, I kind of like too, at over 6.5. This is a Rams offense that going from Goff to Stafford was among the most aggressive passing the ball in the NFL last year. Stafford was fourth in red zone passing rate. He was second in pass rate inside the 10-yard line. He was first in pass rate inside the 5-yard line. And the Rams, 79.7% of their offensive touchdowns last year were passing touchdowns, number one in the NFL. So I think that this is way too low on Allen Robinson going into the season. Mm -hmm. Robert Woods was on pace to break 850 yards last year in this offense before he tore his ACL. He was on pace to do it in only 14 games. So I like these numbers on Allen Robinson. And I think you can make an argument. Now, we can have a narrative debate here on whether or not him playing like crap and on a bad team last year makes him eligible for comeback player of the year in the minds of the voters uh, because it's usually an injury thing. But 30-1 to on Allen Robinson for comeback player of the year. The Rams, as you would imagine, with a team like this, with going kind of all in, being the returning champion, the best number you can find on them to win the Super Bowl is 12-1. to Right now, they are they are sitting right there, kind of the same number you can find the Packers and the Chiefs and the Chargers. Kind of they're in that little range right there as far as Super Bowl favorites go. Steven, I get it. I understand why they're the number that they're at. I look at this division as well. I think it's a two-team division, two-and-a-half team division. So I get it from that standpoint as well. You're getting two free wins against the Seahawks for sure. The Cardinals, where are they at? What are they going to look like the second half of the season? Are they going to fade like they have so many times before? So I I understand the numbers here with the squad. And if you kind of look at the projections, they're projected to be very, very good again. In those million projections that Football Outsiders does, they have them as the fourth overall team DVOA, the ninth best offense, the fifth best defense so, you know, again, they have them being very, very, very good. And a lot of that has to do with the units that are out there that are still really good. I mean, yes, you lose an Andrew Whitworth, that is never good for an offensive line. But this Joseph Noteboom guy who, when he did, when, when he was forced into playing last season, actually performed very, very well. So you kind of have a top 10-ish borderline offensive line as we head into the season. You've got a top 10 for sure, maybe even top five if Allen Robinson is still Allen Robinson pass catching group because you have Cooper Cup, you have Allen Robinson, and then you have Tyler Higby, who's kind of an underrated tight end. Van Jefferson's going to be back in a few weeks. Tutu Atwell is kind of running at the number three right now, who apparently, for again, it's everybody looks awesome season, but I mean, apparently looks really <laughs> great in training camp and is, is doing very well for them. The defensive line, is I mean, listen, you've got Aaron Donald, so that's all I need to say. But then, oh, by the way, Leonard Floyd, Sean Robinson, Greg Gaines, Justin Hollins, these are all guys that are going to rotate in, keep that line fresh, and, and allow Aaron Donald to be the beast that he is 
on that lineup. If you have Donald Robinson and Gaines on the line uh, on the line at the same time, Stephen, you have the number one, eleven, and twenty seven defensive linemen graded by Pro Football Focus last season in all of the NFL. You have one, eleven, and twenty seven on the same defensive line. Going at it every single time. They're going to cause all kinds of havoc. And then, of course, the secondary still has Jalen Ramsey. They added Troy Hill. You've got a Taylor Rapp and a Jordan Fuller. So um, it's it's hard to poke holes here in this Rams team, really top to bottom, outside of, you know, are, is there more to this Matthew Stafford thing than we think? I think probably not. But if you look at the secondary solid, defensive line solid, offensive line solid, pass catcher solid, it's it's like where do you tell me that this team is going to go awry, you know? For sure. Yeah, I obviously all of this is contingent on Stafford being healthy. So that's yeah. that's what I'm operating on. But you mentioned the defensive line, the secondary as well, not just Jalen Ramsey. I think Troy Hill is in line for a bounce back season. He had a grade of just 53 in coverage with Cleveland last year, but with the Rams the year before, a grade of 76. And then they have another cornerback, David Long, who is a top 32 corner in terms of adjusted yards allowed per snap. So uh, three deep at the cornerback position on top of their elite defensive line. And people keep asking, like, how are the Rams doing this? How do they give up all their draft picks and still fall under the salary cap? And we've talked on previous podcasts about the cheat code that is rookie contracts. Now, Matthew Stafford isn't that. But he's not expensive either. The Rams are only the 19th ranked team in the NFL in quarterback spending. They're also outside the top 20 in running back spending. That's a pretty good start right there to be able to afford your other positions and other elite talent, which they have. So the other question that people keep bringing up, and it's really hard to to predict this, but the Rams have just been incredibly healthy under Sean McVay. Mm And can they continue to do it? They have been top 10 all four years over the past four uh, in terms of of not missing guys in games due to injury. And our, our new injury expert, Will Carroll, has a good relationship with that staff. And he's told us that the Rams medical staff is elite, one of the best in the NFL in terms of maintenance for their players. They have a system down that they've done year over the year. And I think it would be ignorant to say that's not at least playing a, a some part in them being able to stay healthy throughout the season um, and 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 be a little bit more lucky quote unquote than other teams. So I'm not going to just immediately assume that there's going to be negative regression for the Rams with injuries going into this season because they've maintained this level of health for four years now. And the other side of this too, Matt, they might actually get some positive regression. They were actually a little unlucky on the field last year. They were only plus two in turnovers, and they were 26th in fumble luck. So you could actually see better results from the Rams this year if if things go their way. So I was having a hard – Yeah, go ahead. I think the only knock is the schedule. I think the only knock is the the second toughest schedule. It's the second toughest schedule in the NFL heading into the season. Now, it's fortunate when you're one of the best teams in the NFL to navigate through a difficult schedule. But, you know, Bills in week one, you got to go at Tampa in week nine. You got to go at New Orleans in week 11. You got to go at Kansas City in week 12. And then you go at Green Bay in week 15. And so there's that stretch there outside of the Bills in week one. But you're looking between nine and 15 where you got to go cross country to Tampa, cross country to New Orleans. Then you got to go to Kansas City. Then you got to go back a, a couple of weeks later to Green Bay. So there are some things in that schedule where you're like, hey, look, if they're if they're not playing their absolute best football at the time, maybe there's a trip up or two somewhere along the way. So again, if we're if we're trying to nitpick, if we want to pick anything apart with this team, it could just be the difficulty of that schedule. The 49ers have a question at quarterback, which we'll get into, but I think top to bottom roster wise, you can make an argument that the two best rosters in the conference are the Rams and the 49ers with the age of the Bucks right now. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a bloodbath here. I can't, I couldn't find any reason to, to fade them at a plus number to win the division. I don't know if we're going to get much better price after the first week of the season, but if if they lose to the Bills and the Niners beat a cupcake week one, maybe we get a a little bit better number on the Rams. But um, just on paper going into this season, 
it, it's hard for me to to nitpick this Rams team like I did last year, and they go on all the way to win the Super Bowl. So I think yeah. that McVay is is sharp when it comes to game planning. I think he completely went back to what he wants to do with a quarterback that he trusts last year. I mean, Matthew Stafford was double what Jared Goff was on yards per attempt on deep drops and deep passes. They went from a negative EPA per attempt to a positive on play action going from Goff to Stafford. Stafford was top five in EPA per attempt without play action. And Sean McVay went back to using a lot more one tight end, one running back personnel groupings, went from 60% to 87% last season with Stafford under center. So that, that allows them to disguise runs more often, lighter boxes for the run when you have three wide receivers on the field. So from a game planning perspective, McVay is is one of the best. The only thing I'd like to see more of is that he needs to be a little bit more aggressive on fourth downs, I think. They had 10 opportunities to go for it on fourth down in the six games they lost last year, and he only went for it twice. So and that those were fourth and five or shorter. So that's kind of where I'm at. I think from a from a game planning, he's great. I think in game he could be a little bit better. But I mean, if we're trying to poke holes in this roster, it's kind of a stretch. Yeah, it's really tough. Again, plus one twenty five, the best number you can get on them to win the West. If somebody said, "Hey, I really want to bet on the NFC West. I live out here. I you know really like football to watch out here." I, if they if they told me they wanted to bet on the Rams, I'm not talking them out of it. I, I still think that. You know, yeah, there's some upshot for some of these other teams, but I still think that the Rams are definitely the clear-cut favorite. And just remember, guys, uh, Odell does loom. He is he is still yep. a free agent. There's a high likelihood that the Rams would just take him back because you know the devil, you know stuff like that situation. So again, they could have a they could have a guy that comes in and just you know more of a red zone presence. I think at that point for for uh, Odell Beckham, but again, nice red zone presence to have as you head down the stretch and trying to make a run.